Thanks. Welcome to Senior Advanced Session 2. Leopold Kroniker once said, God made the integers. All else is the work of man. He said this during a time period where it was particularly controversial whether or not man discovered math or man created math, and in his opinion, it was a combination of both. Today, we're going to be discussing some of the applications of the integers, which Leopold Kroniker claims are man-made. Okay, let's look at the first topic we'll be discussing. Topic number one is numerical properties. We're just going to be discussing numbers and how to use them. The first thing within this we will be discussing is the classification of numbers. Some such classifications are rational numbers and irrational numbers. However, we're going to be discussing those in a lot more detail after we discuss classification. The next topic we're going to be discussing is logic. This is probably going to be the largest portion of the lecture. We're going to be discussing converse, inverse, and contrapositive, which you've probably been exposed to if you've taken an introductory geometry course. However, truth tables are a more advanced concept, and unless you've taken a course specifically centered around logic, you've probably never seen them before. The last section, and probably the most important section, is going to be on proofs. Now we're going to teach you various methods you can use for proving things, from pure logic to contradiction to induction to pigeonhole. We're also going to be talking to you about some of the vernacular used when asking you to prove something so that you know exactly what you're trying to prove, rather than being in the dark and just trying to guess what the question's asking you. Let's start with our first section, numerical properties. This section is covered in the lecture notes, and I'd appreciate it if you had your lecture notes on hand. I'm going to be telling you to do the practice problems in the lecture notes as we cover the material. Right now, we're going to begin at the top of the lecture notes at classifying numbers. So please, get your lecture notes out or print them if you don't have them yet. As you probably already know, the integers are all numbers with no decimal expansion after them. These include positives, like 1, 2, and 3, 0, and negatives, like negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. What do we call these various subclassifications? Well, positive integers are called the natural numbers, they're the counting numbers that you learn first. One, two, three, four whole numbers include all of the counting numbers as well as zero. And negative numbers, negative integers, are the ones that are simply the negative counterparts of all of the natural numbers. If I tell you to, find a, to name a positive integer, you cannot name zero. As we know, one, two, three, etc. are the positive integers. However, if I told you to name a non-negative integer, you could name zero. Same goes for negative integers. If I said name a negative integer, you can't name zero. But if I said name a non-positive integer, you can. So asking you to find or to prove something for all non-negative numbers means you have to prove it for zero as well. But Saying you have to prove something for all positive numbers means you don't have to prove it for zero. The next level up is rational numbers. Rational numbers include the integers. Rational numbers are any numbers that can be expressed as p over q, where the fraction is in lowest terms, meaning p and q have no factors in common. The numerator and the denominator must both be integers and only one of them can be negative. For example, three is three over one, which is p over q. Three and one are both integers, meaning three is a rational number. Two over four equals one over two. Since one over two is in lowest terms, two over four is a rational number. Lastly, two over seven is a rational number. It's already in rational number form, it's expressed as 2 over 7. These are both integers, and they're not both negative, which means that 2 over 7 is a rational number. Irrational numbers are the vast majority of all numbers. They are numbers whose decimal expansion repeats on forever. If you took pi, you could never ever write out its entire decimal expansion because it's infinite and you can't try to summarize it because it never repeats. This is the very definition of irrational numbers. Numbers with infinite decimal expansions 
that never terminate and never repeat. As practice is 2.75578 repeating forever or this number, rational or irrational? The answer is that it is rational. This is because it repeats. Remember, irrational numbers never terminate or repeat. If you didn't get that, please look over the material again, read the top of the lecture notes, read 2.1, make sure you understand this material because it's going to be critical for moving forward in the lesson. Before we move on, try the practice problem under 2.1. The practice problem says to prove that if p over q is in lowest terms, that p squared over q squared must also be in lowest terms. Moving on, we're going to be discussing rational numbers. However, since we've already discussed the definition of rational numbers, we're going to be discussing how we can turn a repeating decimal, like the one we saw in our practice problem, into a fraction. At this point, you should be around right here on the notes, at 2.2, turning a repeating decimal into a fraction. How do we turn a repeating decimal into a fraction? Well, first, we label the initial number as x. Then, we multiply it until we have the same decimal expansion on the right side of the decimal point. In this case, we need to move the decimal point three spaces because it repeats for three digits. This means we have to multiply by 1,000. So, 2,549.549 repeating equals 1,000x. Then, we, re we subtract this from this, and we get 2,547 equals 999x. So, we get that 2,547 over 999 equals x which simplifies to 283 over 111. And that's how you turn repeating decimals into fractions. There's a practice problem on page two, right here, that you should try now to make sure you have a good understanding of this. There are two kinds of irrational numbers, algebraic and transcendental. Algebraic numbers, such as the square root of two, can be solutions to polynomials that have rational coefficients. The square root of two is a root in this polynomial. Notice that the polynomial has coefficients one and negative two. This means that the square root of two is a solution to a polynomial that has rational coefficients, one and negative two. However, one of the few polynomials that pi, a transcendental number, is a solution to have to have pi as the coefficient. There's no way to create an equation, no matter what we use as the power of x, what other terms we put in there, with only rational solutions that, um, of which pi is a root. The only way to make pi a root of a polynomial is to make pi one of the coefficients. But pi is not rational. Thus, Pi is not a solution to any polynomials with rational coefficients, and thus is not algebraic. All non-algebraic numbers are considered transcendental. Finishing up this section, there is a proof in your lecture notes that the square root of 2 is irrational. Read through the proof, and then generalize it for the square root of any prime number, not just 2. The next topic is converse, inverse, and contrapositive. Let's start out with a riddle. You're in a room with four cards. Each of them, 100% guaranteed, has a letter and a number on it. So A and D, these cards have their letter showing, which means they must have a number on the other side. And these numbers are showing, which means that on the other side of these cards, there must be a letter showing. So you are told that you are testing whether or not this statement is true. If a card has a vowel on one side, it has an even number on the other. Which cards do you have to turn over in order to guarantee that this is true? 
The answer, surprisingly, is A and 7. Let's discuss why. Let's look at a simple example of an if-then statement. If an animal is a shark, then it is a fish. This is because all sharks are fish. So if I tell you this animal is a shark, you know that it is in fact a fish. This is in the form if A, then B, where A is animal is a shark and B is animal is a fish. This middle symbol is red implies. So what this statement would say is animal is a shark implies animal is a fish. The converse of the statement is simply switching around which one implies the other. So the converse of fish implies shark is shark implies fish. Or if an animal is a fish, then it is a shark. However, this is not necessarily true. There are plenty of fish that aren't sharks. Simply saying if a fish is a fish, then it's also a shark, is blatantly wrong. I mean, we have yellow tangs, clownfish, we have barracudas, we have all these fish that aren't sharks. So we can conclude that the converse is not necessarily true. The next type of statement is an inverse. The inverse of A implies B is that not A implies not B. Or, in our example, if an animal is not a shark, then it is not a fish. Because A was being a shark and B was being a fish. However, that's again not necessarily true. Consider again the example of a tang or a barracuda. They are not sharks, but if this inverse was true, that would mean that they are also not fish, which they are. So we can conclude that the inverse is also not necessarily true. The final statement is the contrapositive. The contrapositive of A implies B is that not B implies not A. If the original statement was true, the contrapositive will also be true. Our contrapositive is, if not a fish, then not a shark. And that's true. There's no animal that's not a fish that is a shark. So we can conclude that contrapositives are true, as long as the original statement is true. However, it's also important to note that the contrapositive of the converse is the inverse, yes? Because the converse is B then A. So the contrapositive of that would be not A then not B, which is the inverse. Which means that the converse and the inverse also have the same truth value. If the converse is true, then its contrapositive, which is the inverse, must also be true. So contrapositive of one, the contrapositive of the contrapositive is just the original statement again. Let's take a look back at our riddle. Knowing how to simplify if-then statements, we get that vowel card implies even card. Letting vowel equal A and even equal B, we know that this must be true. However, we know that even then vowel does not have to be true. Additionally, not value or vowel implies not even does also not have to be true. Lastly, we get not even implies not value, vowel. This is the contrapositive, and thus must be true. So, we get that the original statement corresponds to A. We need to check that this has an even on the other side. We get this even then vowel corresponds to four. A lot of people will say that we have to test four. However, that's not true. We didn't necessarily say all even cards have vowels. Just all vowel cards have even numbers. 
So it's possible that even if this doesn't have a vowel, the rule can still hold true. So we don't have to check it. This not vowel implies not even is D. We don't have to check that this doesn't have an even card behind it, because even if it did, we're not saying that evens exclusively apply to values. But we do have to check seven, because if this on the other side is a vowel, then our rule does not hold, because that, value, that, that vowel does not have an even on the other side. So we have to check seven to make sure there is not a vowel on the other side. We can look at this in, through the eyes of our shark example. Imagine if we were testing the rule that all sharks are fish. And vowel was shark and even was fish. And we have a shark, something that's not a shark, something that's a fish, and something that is not a fish. First, we have to check to make sure the shark's a fish. Next, this thing would be not a shark, which means it's not relevant at all. This thing is a fish, but we're not saying all fish are sharks. So even if we tested this and it wasn't a shark, it's still not relevant. But then we have something that's not a fish. We need a test to make sure it's not a shark either, because if it is a shark, then our rule is violated. So we still have to check these two because they are the equivalent of the original statement and the contrapositive. Whereas this is the inverse and this is the equivalent of the converse, which are not necessarily true. Next, we're going to discuss if, only if, and if with two f's, which is if and only if. Let's start by examining the statement if. Say we have the conditional b imply, or a implies b. Then we have our equivalent, shark implies fish. If a implies b, then this statement is also true. b if a. Fish if shark. Now this is true, because if you are a shark, you're a fish. So you are a fish if you are a shark. But a if b is not true, because that is shark if fish. But again, there are other things that are fish and not sharks. So shark if fish is not true necessarily. This means that the statement A if B is equivalent to the conditional B implies A. Similarly, A only if B is equivalent to the conditional A implies B. And A if and only if B means A and B imply each other. For example, we have our shark example for the first one. If we have, if we label B as shark and A as fish, we have shark implies fish, thus fish if shark. In this one, let's label A shark and B fish. Again, shark implies fish but we have shark only if fish, which means that, there is, that if you are not a fish, there is no way for you to be a shark. Now this one, we can't use our shark fish example. We will use numbers being even and numbers being multiples of two. Let's label A as a number being even and B as a multiple of two. A if and only if B means that if a number, is even, that implies it is a multiple of two, and if a number is a multiple of two, it implies it being even. In these ones, the ones that where you can only fill in if or only if, these conditionals, their inverses and their contrapositives are false. But if A and B imply each other, then the inverse and converse of A implies B or B implies A will both be true. Our next topic is going to be truth tables. Before we jump into this topic, in your lecture notes at the bottom of the second to last page, there is a space for you to prove that if P, if and only if Q is true, 
then Q, if and only if P, is also true. Try to prove Y in the space below. Now, we're going to learn about truth tables. The first symbol we're going to learn about is this one. It means and. So, we have two statements, A and B. And we're trying to find the truth value of A and B. Whoops. So, let's look at A and B. Are A and B both true when A is true and B is true? Yes. When A is true and B is false, are they both true? No. So the value of A and B is false. This same logic applies to the rest of them. For the rest of them, at least one is false. Thus, we have TFFF as the truth value of A and B. When setting up any truth table, you start with A and B all the way on the left. For A, you write TTFF, and B, you write TFTF. This way, you get all possible combinations of the truth values of the two statements, either both true, A is true, but B is false, A is false, but B is true, and both false. And then you can use that to get all cases of the truth value of A and B. Now let's determine the truth value of A or B. This V, or the upside down and symbol, is the or sign. When we say A or B, we mean that either A or B must be true. So, let's put in T, T. Is either one true? Yes, we have at least one true. So A or B is true. T and F, well, we have at least one T, so it's still true. Same goes for this one, we have one true, so the whole thing is true. For the last one, we have false false, there are no true values. And thus, A or B here is false. The last type of operation we'll have is A implies B. However, since we're in a truth table, we can't really know anything about the actual statements A and B. And so we have to distance ourselves from the actual meaning of implication. We're just going to assume that the implication is true as long as it is, as long as it is not necessarily false. So true, true, we're going to say that, oh, A implies B, and A is true, that means B is true, okay. We're going to call the conditional true. But if A is true and B is still false, it is false. A is false, but B is still true, that's fine, because we're not saying that B can only be implied by A. So we're going to still say that this is true. Again, we don't really know anything about the actual values of A and B, so we can't tell for certain whether or not B is reliant on A, but we're going to just assume that it is unless the truth table proves to us otherwise. This last one does not prove to us otherwise, so we still have true. Let's say we want to do a truth value for a slightly more complicated expression. This one is A and B implies A or B. Well, we can't just tell by looking at it. So the first thing we have to do is start to find out the truth values of these pieces. Let's start with A here. Let's start with A and B. Well, we already know the truth value of this. It's true, false, false, false. And we also know the truth value of A or B. It's true, 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 false. Now we just need to find the value of the conditional, where this implies this. Remember, the only way for the conditional to be false is if the first thing is false, or if the first thing is true, and the second thing is still false. So we find all trues in the first one. Right here is the only true. Does this true have a false after it? No. That means that all of them are true. So we know that A and B implies A or B is always true. Now, 
But what if we had this? But they imply each other. A two-way arrow means that they have to imply each other, which means anytime the truth values don't match, it is false. In this case, we have the truth values don't match here, and the truth values don't match here. Right. So we have falses here. Everywhere else, the truth values match, and so they're true. There will be problems not on the classwork, but on the homework, where you're going to have to try to figure out um, yeah. some of these more complex truth values. And when we check your answer, we're not going to check all of this on the inside. We're just going to check this final truth value compared to these. So if you wrote these in a slightly different order, it's not going to affect your score. Congratulations, you've just finished the longest and hardest section of the lecture. We're going to now be moving on to proofs. Now the proof section, it's not exactly something we can teach you. Now we can teach you the methods in which you can prove things. We can teach you the vernacular. But a proof is really a measure of your critical thinking. All we're going to be teaching you is how to put that critical thinking into writing and into a proof format. So you're not going to be learning how to just instantly know the answer to a proof. That's going to require your own critical thinking. But this section is going to cover, you know, the tools you're going to need in order to put your thinking into a proof. The next topic we'll be learning about are the definitions and key phrases that you'll need to understand in order to be able to write proofs successfully. The three key phrases are in this numbered list at the top of the second to last page of your lecture notes. Please follow along there. The first definition is distinct. Distinct means non-similar. For example, four and seven are distinct from each other, but four and four are not. Additionally, um, a triangle with lengths five, five, and seven is not distinct from a triangle with lengths seven, seven, and five. These triangles are the same triangle by SSS similarity, meaning that since they are the same triangle, they're non-distinct from each other. However, if this side length was instead, say, three, then the triangles would be distinct from each other. The next two words we're going to be covering are maximum and minimum. If I ask you to prove something, say, five is the maximum value in a certain function, it's not enough to prove to me that there is no number in the function greater than five, or even that every attainable number in the function is less than five. You have to also tell me, you have to also prove that five itself is attainable. So to prove something is a maximum or a minimum, you have to prove that the number is attainable as well as the fact that it's bigger than any other number you can get. For example, if I asked you to do a proof like this, prove that 13 is or is not the maximum integer value of the question mark, you may start by looking at the triangle inequality and knowing that the question mark has to be less than seven plus five, which means the question mark, or all values of the question mark, have to be less than 12. And you might think, oh wow, well 13 is greater than all of these other values of question mark. So you might assume that 13 is the maximum. However, this isn't true because 13 itself isn't attainable. 13 itself doesn't fall within the value. That's like saying if we had a parabola right here, it was an upside down parabola, and it just barely touched the x-axis, that the maximum value was up here. No, all we know about this value here is that it's greater than all possible values. But we don't know, or we actually do know, it's not attainable in this function. It's not an actual value. This point, there are no points along this line that intersect with this parabola. Just like there is no way 
that 13 could be this. Thus, even though it is greater than all other values that could possibly be the question mark, since it, it itself can't be one of the values of the question mark, it cannot be the maximum. The last word is rigorous. Now this might seem like a hard and long word, but it's actually really simple. The only thing you need to know about the word rigorous is that it means that the proof is complete and that the proof doesn't have holes. Proof by contradiction at first sounds pretty complicated. However, it's actually really simple. Say we wanted to prove that the square root of negative one does not equal one. We wanted to prove that. Well, the first step in our proof would be to assume it does equal one. Then carry out a process of steps showing how assuming this leads to an incorrect result. For example, assuming this would mean that the square root of negative six equals the square root of six. Squaring both sides means that negative six equals six. Thus, from a since assuming this leads to an incorrect assumption or an incorrect statement, we can actually conclude that this was a false assumption in the first place. Essentially, assuming this breaks math. I'm not going to give you an example of a difficult or complicated proof by contradiction because you have one in your lecture notes. The proof about the square root of negative two being irrational is actually a proof by contradiction. Remember, the first step was to assume that the square root of two was rational. Thus, the proof that the square root of two is irrational is a proof by contradiction. Proof by induction is one of the best ways to prove something. It's simple and it's quick. However, the one, one of the main downsides of proof by induction is that it only works for integers. You can never really use proof by induction to prove a statement for everything. Here's why. Say we wanted to prove that 2k over 2 equals k. Now this may seem obvious, however we're just going to use a proof by induction to prove that so that you can get an idea of what a proof by induction is. The first step in proof by induction is to pick an initial value. Say k equals 0. Then you plug in 0 for it and see if it's true. If it's true for k equals 0, then your first step is correct. Then you plug in k plus 1, and you, see that, uh, and you see that this is true as well. If it's true for k plus 1, and it's true for k equals 0, then it's true for 0 plus 1, which is 1. And it's true for that k, so it's true for 1 plus 1 equals 2. Thus, it's going to be true for all whole numbers, from 0 all the way to infinity. However, it's only going to be true for whole numbers. You don't know if this is true for one half. You don't know if this is true for negative three. If you wanted to prove it for halves, you can plug in k plus a half and get for all multiples of a half, it will be true. If you wanted to go negative, if you wanted to get all the negative integers, you could prove k minus one. However, there will be no way for you to prove it for all irrational, transcendental, every single number. That's not a thing you can do with proof by induction. So if your goal is to prove something for every number, Proof by induction is not the way to go. However, if your goal is to prove something for every integer, proof by induction can be a very useful tool. The last principle that you're going to need to learn in order to be successful at writing proofs is the pigeonhole principle. It's a really simple principle, but once you figure out how to apply it in proofs, it can be really useful. For example, if I asked you, what number of socks do I need to pull out of a drawer with seven blue socks, two red ones, and four orange socks, in order to ensure I have at least one pair of the same colored socks, what would your answer be? Well, let's start with one. One sock, we almost, we certainly can't have a pair because there's only one, so it could be in any one of these. With the second sock, if we pair, pull out two socks, we could have a sock here, a sock here. There's no guarantee that both the socks will be the same color. So we can't be sure that pulling out two socks is going to give us a pair. If there's three socks, while well, there might be a pair that's more likely than with only two socks that you'll have a pair, it's still not guaranteed that you'll have a pair. You could pull out a blue one, a red one, and an orange one. However, your fourth sock must form a pair. It must form a pair somewhere because there's nowhere else for it to go. Right? We can't have four socks of four different colors because there aren't four different colors. So after pulling out four socks, we can guarantee 
we have at least one pair of colored socks. Now, this might not seem very useful. However, imagine you were asked to prove something else. Like, if you had a 90 degree angle, and you had this vertex here, and two rays coming out of the vertex at totally random angles, just as long as they're within the angle itself. How could you prove that the angle between either this ray and this ray, this ray and this ray, or this ray and this ray, that at least one of these has to be less than or equal to 30 degrees? So we have the measure of x, y, or z is less than or equal to 30 degrees. How would you do that? Well, start by assuming all of them are greater than 30 degrees, right? That all of them are greater than 30 degrees, then we have that the measure of x plus y plus z has to be greater than 90, because each of them are greater than 30. Well, it doesn't make any sense because these three angles sum to be 90. So the measure of x plus y and z can't be over 90. Thus, at least one of them has to have a value that is less than or equal to 30 degrees. And that's how you would employ the pigeonhole principle when solving actual proofs. And with that, we are done. That's all the knowledge you need in order to be successful on this week's classwork and homework. It's important to remember that the classwork is going to be in a different format than usual this time. Instead of having 20 one-point questions, you're going to have 10 one-point questions on stuff we covered in class, like classification of numbers, converse inverse contrapositive, repeating decimals to fractions, and then you're going to have five questions worth two points each, and they are going to be proofs. Now, I know proofs are very time-consuming, and there is a time limit on the test. However, we are going to try to give you more time on the test this time in order for you to have time to really think about these proofs. However, in order for that to happen, we need to spend less time reviewing the lecture, meaning you need to have a really good handle on the content covered in this lecture. If you don't, use the internet, rewatch the lecture, go through your lecture notes, comment, and I will try to respond to your comments if it's before the next session on August 25th, and just do your best to figure out, understand the content presented in this lecture and in your lecture notes, otherwise, you're going to have, end up having less time to take your quit, your test, which is just going to mean you get a lower score. And we want to give you that extra time because in all honesty, these proofs are actually really fun and we want you guys to have a chance to do them. So just remember to make sure that you understand all of this. And if you're an online student, be sure to subscribe to this channel to make sure that you know when the next videos are up. And even if you're not an online student, you should still subscribe and like the video. Thank you. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe and like. If you have any questions, you can email info at agoramagical.org or comment below and we'll reply back. Maybe. And if you want to see practice things or anything about us, you can visit our website, which is basically the end of the email, but without the info and the end. So bye.